self-advocate. Uh, my name is Brett. I'm a self-advocate. Um, I've been here for almost two years. So I'll be by January, it'll be my second year as doing being self-advocate. And I love doing what I'm doing because it's helping and we're trying to make improving. I've done a lot of workshops over the past few months, over these two years almost. I've been doing and then this coming Saturday, we're going to speaking out, just so you know. So in a minute, Sarah's going to read the land acknowledgement that we're also going to be doing as a speaking out on Saturday also. So I'm glad that I do this field as a self-advocate and help and to try to make a difference in the world because I'm hoping that in a couple of years or hopefully because I know it takes time that we're going to make change, that everybody will be treated the same way and be treated equally. So then we'll all be able to do everything and work and not have to be judged based on our little disabilities. I always call it little disabilities because I don't like the word disability. So I call it ability. I like the word abilities because everybody has abilities to learn. Everybody has strengths and needs and have to work on everything. So I feel like everybody helps one another. So I think that it is so great that I do this thing to help others and help people um, that are nervous and scared and stuff to even speak out to try to get them out of their comfort zone so they could fight for their rights. Because I feel like everybody at one point need to get their rights heard and everybody needs to get heard. So thank you for having me here today to let me know, let you know who I am and get to know me. And now I'm going to send it to Sarah to read the land acknowledgement. Thanks, Brett. Um... Hello, my name is Sarah Jay, and uh, just very briefly, I've been part of the Respecting Rights group um, for almost exactly the same amount of time as Brett. Um, and like he said, it's it's wonderful to be able to be part of a group to try to make a difference for those who have disabilities that may not feel they have a voice. So um, this line, uh, this is a land acknowledgement um, that the Respecting Rights Group wrote and will be part of our presentation at the Speaking Out Conference on Saturday. While we meet today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the, of the Indigenous peoples of the lands that we now call home. We come with respect for the land that we are on today and for the people who have lived here in the past and for those who reside here now. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral territory that was taken from all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people. Let's join in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the unforgivable injustices, harms, and wrongdoings of the past. Let us also join in a commitment to making change today. In the disability community, we stand in solidarity and commit to never allowing harms like the, like the residential schools and institutions to happen again. When there is change, we can forgive. Together, we can heal. We acknowledge that we care. Thank you. And for that, I say goodbye. Thank you, Sarah. Yep, I'll just no turn problem. it over to our chair, Douglas. Thank you. All right, take care. Thanks, Bob. Um, just want to verify that you can that I'm visible and audible since I don't see myself on screen at the moment. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Sarah and Brett for their for their for starting us off with that nice acknowledgement uh, land acknowledgement and for their their efforts and hard work. I'm Douglas Waxman. I'm the current chair of Arches Board of Directors, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's annual general meeting. 
Um, we have uh, the, the, the beginning is going to be a little bit of a boring phase here. We've got some housekeeping notes that I have told I must read or uh, Doreen won't like me anymore. So here we go. Uh, please note that the presentation and the meeting are being recorded. Please make sure your microphones and videos are turned off. This meeting is being presented with both ASL and captioning. ASL is available in a in separate video window, in a separate video window. You can keep this window in view by pinning it. To do this at the top of your screen, hover over the window of the ASL interpreter you wish to pin and click pin video. You can also hide non-video participants by right-clicking on any participant that either has their video off or joined by telephone. This allows you to only see the presenters and the ASL interpreters on your screen. Please be advised that interpreters will be switching periodically. At this time, we will pause the presentation to allow the participants to pin the new video window. Captioning will also be available in Zoom as well as in, different, in a different tab on your browser. To enable captioning in Zoom, select the CC icon. If you prefer captioning in a different tab in your browser, use the captioning link posted in the chat box. If you are a member, please take a moment to ensure your Zoom name displays your full name so that we can record you as present at the meeting. To rename yourself, right-click on your video window and type in your full name. For those ARCH members on the phone, we will ask for your name before the business part of the meeting so that our staff can enter your full name in Zoom. The business part of the meeting will begin after the presentations and a short break. In order to facilitate voting, only registered ARCH members can attend the business portion of the evening. Guests will be asked to leave the meeting at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, please use the raised hand feature in Zoom. If you are using sign language to sign a question, please type your name in the chat to let us know that you have a question via ASL. The moderator will say your name when it's time for you to ask your question. At that time, you can turn on your video and sign your question. To access technical support, to access technical support email, please email at general at arch.clcj.ca, all in lowercase. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our executive director, our amazing uh, leader Rob Latanzio for his, to give his um, annual report. Or sorry, to introduce our guest speaker. I'm getting ahead of myself, Rob, if you would. Thank you so much, Douglas. Uh, that's right. So I am uh, absolutely honored to uh, introduce and present our our keynote speaker. Um, first, just a. a a sincere thanks, Douglas, for starting us off. And of course, Brett and, um, and Sarah, thank you so much for your opening remarks and uh, wonderful land acknowledgement and, and for all the work that you do with respecting rights. So as Douglas mentioned, my name is Robert Latanzio and I am the executive director uh, here at Arch Disability Law Center. So our theme for this evening is one of reflection. So it's titled Reflecting on 40 Years of Disability in the Human Rights Code. On June 15, 1982, amendments to the Ontario's Human Rights Code came into force, which included disability as a prohibited ground of discrimination. So this was a monumental moment for the disability rights movement. The Coalition on Human Rights for the Handicapped, as it was called, was formed in 1979 and represented over 75 disability-related advocacy groups and agencies to oppose versions of the Human Rights Bill and advocate for stronger amendments that would offer real protection to persons with disabilities in Ontario. 
the disability rights movement was at a particular juncture at this time. And these law reform efforts were critical in shifting the movement within a human rights discourse and within a human rights framework. So ARCH, as we know, was incorporated towards the, the very end of 1979 and has a very interesting history, which is interconnected with the growth and evolution of that movement. Uh, at the time, under the leadership of ARCH's first executive director, David Baker, ARCH had a lead role as the legal resource and as legal counsel to that coalition on human rights. And that coalition um, really worked um, uh, exclusively in, in trying to focus in achieving amendments to the code that advanced the human rights of persons with disabilities in Ontario. So, so 40 years later, we reflect on how human rights case law has evolved and how it continues to be used to advance the agenda of full inclusion and full equality of persons with disabilities. We are so fortunate this evening to have Ina Chatta with us, a relentless human rights champion and leader and leading thinker in human rights and equality law. And uh, this truly is a treat to, um, to get to, to really just sit back and um, um, just um, listen to Ina's reflections on, on human rights and disability over the, last, uh, over the last 40 years. Ina is an experienced human rights lawyer, investigator, educator, and mediator. Uh, and uh, Ina was called to the bar in 1994 to the Ontario Bar. A proud member of the South Asian community of Brampton, her career is dedicated to working in the areas of equality rights and conflict resolution. Ina wears many hats, as we all know, um, and is currently the chair of the Human Rights Legal Support Center. From July 2020 to August 2021, Ina served as Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, leading the commission during the transition period and the unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ina's tenure as Chief Commissioner was dedicated to tackling systemic discrimination in education, health, and policing. And I can certainly say from Arch's perspective that we greatly appreciated Ina's efforts during the pandemic in her role as Chief Commissioner. Prior to Ina's appointment as Chief Commissioner, she served as co-reviewer of the Systemic Racism Review of the Peel District School Board and chair of the Board of Directors of the Human Rights Legal Support Center. Ina was a precedent-setting vice chair with the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario from 2007 to 2015. And Ina has the distinction of taking on important leadership roles in all three of the human rights pillars in Ontario. Prior to that appointment to the tribunal, Ina was the director of litigation at ARCH from 1999 to 2007. Ina appeared before various tribunals, trial and appellate courts, including prominent constitutional challenges at the Supreme Court of Canada, advancing charter rights in the areas of workers' compensation, immigration law, and government services. Ina has won and continues to win countless awards, most recently the Ontario Bar Association's 2022 Distinguished Service Award. Ina is also a dear friend, and Ina was the director of litigation when I began as an articling student at ARCH. I've learned so much from Ina, and I'm so grateful for her friendship and mentorship. Every interaction with Ina presents some important learning opportunity, and that's not an exaggeration. Ina always demanded the highest of standards and a rigor in all that she did and continues to do. This holds true in every position that she has held. Her decisions at the tribunal, for example, are still a must read. So thorough, so well researched, so well reasoned and educational. For those who know her, she is truly a force and we're so glad that she's on our side. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to turn the floor over to you, Ina. Thank you, Rob. Wow, what an opening. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to uh, fulfill all of that, but I'm so grateful that I get to hear you say those things. It's so heartwarming. Uh, let me start by first thanking the Arch Board for inviting me and the staff and organizers who've pulled this very special virtual AGM together. I am happy to join you from my hometown of Brampton, Ontario. Today, Brampton is recognized as the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. 
And I'm grateful to live in and work in this really vibrant community and diverse community. And so I pay my highest regards and my respect to the first inhabitant, inhabitants of this land. I'm genuinely honored to be here and to so pleased to see so many dear friends and familiar faces. I think we'd spend the rest of the evening if I was reciting off the different names. So I give you all a huge virtual hug and thank you for including me. Let me pause and congratulate you, Rob, for the well-deserved recognition in receiving the 2022 Guthrie Award from the Law Foundation of Ontario. Rob, you are truly the equality rights champion here, and I'm so proud to call you a colleague and a friend, but I know you'd want me to say that award honors not just you, but the impressive and dedicated folks that make up the whole ARCH team, the volunteers, the staff, the board members, past and present. So thank you for being our fearless leader and taking us forward. And I'm so grateful that the Law Foundation recognized your important work. Today, we're here to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the inclusion of disability in the Human Rights Code, and to do some time travel back to reflect from a human rights lens on historical highlights that have advanced the disability rights movement. So you can imagine, it's a pretty daunting task for me to try to capture 40 years of incredible disability advocacy in about 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna dive right in and tell you, I have just randomly selected snippets out of the various stories. I don't think that there's a, a theme here other than one that I hope to land at the end. So I ask you to bear with me as I take you on this time travel. And let me start up to the period that Rob already introduced you to, the period leading up to the 1982 inclusion of what was then known as handicap in the Ontario human rights legislation. As Rob mentioned, in the late 1970s, disability organizations and groups were campaigning for the recognition of mental and physical disability. And that was happening on both fronts at the federal and the provincial level, because we were trying to bring back or bring our constitution, an independent constitution federally and provincially. We were trying to have what was known as handicap included in the code. So I took a look at the newspapers from that time. And what that revealed is that the campaign by disability organizations, in fact, involved a lot of jockey, jockeying for political support as various identity groups were pitted and bartered against each other. At the provincial level, local news stories reported that some provincial parties supported including an expansive list of so-called minority identities like handicap, sexual orientation, as well as a movement to protect against sexual harassment. And given the era and the political leanings of the times, some politicians vehemently rejected the inclusion of new grounds like sexual orientation. The, power, uh, the party in power, though, was leaning towards handicap being addressed in a separate legislation outside of the Human Rights Code. In 1979, the Ontario government proposed that handicap, the Handicapped Persons Act as a distinct and freestanding disability statute. The government never intended to amend the existing human rights code to include disability. As one newspaper reported it at that time, the government's efforts to proclaim a separate law for disability protection was in reality the government's efforts to duck that political expo explosive issue of sexual orientation and sexual harassment. In, a, in other words, if the government amended the code to add in handicap, then politicians could also be forced to consider sexual orientation and sexual harassment as part of the law. Indeed, one newspaper headline of the time documented the labor minister, and it was the labor minister's portfolio where the, court, uh, the code uh, fit. It was the jurisdiction of the labor minister to oversee the code. He had stated that the occasional leering 
of at women in the workplace could not constitute sexual harassment. And that's just to give you a taste of some of the uh, salacious and explosive type of discussions that were going on. This might seem a, just merely interesting to you or even inconsequential his, historical trivia. But especially if you think about it in the context of the strides we've made on all three fronts, on the front of disability, sexual orientation, and sexual harassment. But my intention in sharing this is to draw your attention to the fact that the old tactic of divide and conquer has been used against human rights communities for decades. And unfortunately, we witnessed this tried and true method in the early waves of the pandemic. And but for the work of ARCH and disability organizations during the pandemic, we may have succumbed to that tactic. Now, that's a whole other speech, and you all know that David Lepofsky is better suited to lead that discussion. So I'm going to leave it there and take us back to 1981. 1981 marked the United Nations International Year for Disabled Persons. This represented a real opportunity to push against the provincial government's plan of a separate handicap statute. Disability groups launched protests and oppose the separate legislation as stigmatizing. In 1982, when faced with this intense pressure, the government eventually capitulated, ditched the separate bill, and instead enacted an entirely new human rights code. The new code was significantly broader in scope. It included specific provisions prohibiting sexual harassment in the workplace, added several new protected grounds, including handicap. Also in 1982, Canada was the first country to enshrine equality rights for people with physical and mental disabilities in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the highest law of our land as part of the Constitution. Together, these two legislative developments heralded a promise to ensure full participation of people with disabilities in society. The Charter and the Ontario Human Rights Code were seen as the most powerful legal tools to reduce barriers and increase opportunities for people with disabilities. As we look back now, the question is, did the promise of progress in fact materialize? Well, there's no doubt that the scope of disability rights protection improved with the addition of handicap in the new code. Handicap was defined broadly. It encompassed a wide range of physical, intellectual, and mental disabilities. Notably, and really important for the development of disability rights jurisprudence, the definition included the concepts of protection for past, present, real, and perceived disabilities. Those were significant developments with respect to disability, with respect to understanding disability and how discrimination manifests against people with disabilities. However, that said, ultimately, this expansion in the code was constrained by a very explicit statutory exemption. The right to be free of discrimination held by people with disabilities, and particularly those with mobility type of disabilities, was expressly limited by Section 16 of the new 1982 Code. Section 16 held it did not constitute discrimination if a handicapped person could not access the premises or that there was a lack of the necessary amenities, whether that was employment, housing, or services and facilities. That meant people with disabilities who couldn't enter into a place or use the facilities because of pre-existing barriers were not experiencing discrimination. Essentially, the law said that employers, landlords, and service providers with inaccessible buildings were exempt under the code if that barrier, such as an inaccessible amenity was the only problem. For some, this exemption meant the inclusion of handicap in the code was merely window dressing. Leading up to the passing of this new 1982 code, 
Sheila Copps declared in the legislature, how can I justify this legislation to a disabled person who knows that discrimination will continue in jobs and housing as long as there's no provision for reasonable access? So I take you back to that point. When we now celebrate what happened in 1982 with the addition of handicap in the code, there really was no provision for reasonable access to reasonable accommodation. This tells you how far we've come. The promise of integration envisioned in the new code really only crystallized, I would say, in my view, to become an achievement for people with disabilities when the Board of Inquiry adjudicators, many from our partner institution, Osgoode Hall Law School, they, when they breathe life into the rights by challenging conventional stereotypes of disability, and when they restricted that Section 16 exemption to a very narrow interpretation. And that happened often at the urging of disability rights advocates like Arch. And I tell you personally, I believe Arch being the pioneer litigation clinic is the preeminent clinic. And it has been a powerful figure in this journey of moving the law towards meaningful inclusion. Over the years, Arch has been involved in many leading disability rights cases. And again, hearkening back into 1982, one of the first groundbreaking cases was the case of Justin Clark, the first in the Canadian history to use a bliss symbols board to give the court testimony about his experience. Justin was born with severe cerebral palsy. He was placed in a regional care institution because his family and doctors believed he was too physically disabled and believed him to be intellectually incompetent. And on that basis that he couldn't, believed he couldn't make his own decisions. However, Justin's psychiatrist eventually thought otherwise and with the help of Justin's community, David Baker, who Rob pointed out was executive director at Arch at that time, was retained as counsel to fight for Justin's freedom. In November, 1982, there was a six day trial, which included Justin testifying by pointing to symbols on his bliss board to answer questions. When the trial ended, just Judge Matheson declared Justin to be mentally competent and pronounced, with incredible effort, Justin Clark has managed to communicate his passion for freedom, as well as his love for his family during the course of this trial. We have all of us recognized a gentle, trusting, believing spirit, and very much a thinking human being who has his own unique part to play in our compassionate interdependent society. The first case that came under the new 1982 code to deal with handicap was a case called Cameron versus Nelgard Nursing Homes and it was released in 1984. Now, to be candid, I, Arch didn't litigate this case and I mention it because our old friend David Lepofsky was counsel on behalf of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, representing the public interest. And the candor part is I didn't have time to dig into the history. So I wouldn't be surprised if somebody in the audience here will tell me what Arch's connection was to this case, because I suspect there probably is one if we dug back in the files. But what I want to tell you about is the decision of the Board of Inquiry. The Board of Inquiry found that Cindy Cameron was discriminated against because of her handicap when she was refused employment as a nurse's aide. The employer refused to hire Cindy because one of Cindy's hands had fingers that were shorter than the so-called normal hand. The employer felt Cindy would pose a risk to the elderly patients of the nursing home, believing that she would be unable to safely lift patients because of her hand disability. However, the evidence of Cindy's doctors, occupational therapists, and even her former employers established that Cindy was able to perform all the necessary duties, including lifting. The board concluded Cindy was discriminated against and ordered the employer to offer Cindy a job, pay her for 
lost wages and awarded her $2,000 in general damages. In human rights law, awards titled general damages represent compensation for emotional hurt feelings and injury to dignity and self-respect. I point out this first handicap case from 1984 to draw your attention to that award of $2,000 for injury to dignity. Over the decades, we've seen an increase in the quantum of human rights journal damage awards in the range of sometimes 40 and $50,000 for cases, but for successful cases, but not for disability discrimination. We even see awards trip, double and triple that for egregious sexual harassment cases, but not for disability discrimination. We have not seen comparable growth in disability cases. Take, for example, a recent 2021 disability case where the tribunal found a gymnastics club failed to accommodate a seven-year-old with a disability. The club, the tribunal found the club relied on stereotypical assumptions based on the child's autism diagnosis. Though the case was successful, the tribunal only ordered 3,500 for general damages. Now, you might think this is an aberration because it involves a child. Let me tell you about another recent 2021 case, this time an adult with a disability who was denied a service in a restaurant. The tribunal awarded 2000 in compensation for injury to dignity. Remember, that's the same amount that Cindy received 37 years ago for her award. Now, you might be saying, you know, these are service cases which to some of you might not be as comparable to Cindy's employment case where somebody's livelihood's at stake. And if so, I regret to inform you, having surveyed the case law, even in the employment context, there has not been significant strides. Even in the loss of employment cases, they appear to receive lower damages compared to other grounds. Disability cases are receiving awards in the range of five to 15,000. And even when there are findings of serious violations, those awards seem to max out at 30 to 35,000. However, to be clear, those higher end awards are outliers. Hopefully I've made my point that human rights damage awards and disability cases have not kept pace with other grounds. And that after 40 years, of codified protection, we still have to fight just to fight for the recognition, recognition of basic dignity. Damages is clearly an area where we need stronger advocacy and we must strive to set a new high water mark. On this issue of greater advocacy, I urge the lawyers appearing before the HRTO to argue, argue for higher awards on par with other grounds Yet, I also caution you not to yield to this tendency that we see to have to supply proof of your client's harm to emotional well being through disclosure of medical evidence. As disability rights advocates, we need to be sensitive to the heightened vulnerability of people with disabilities in having their confidential medical information opened up and disclosed to try to make a case. We, as disability advocates, we need to come up with more inventive, innovative ways of making that claim that the case warrants general dam higher general damages on par with other grounds without medicalizing the concepts of dignity and self-respect. ARCH has represented people with disabilities and interveners and has been an intervener in important test case can cases uh, all levels of the courts and tribunals and before the Supreme Court. In fact, 25 years ago in 1997, Arch was involved in the two seminal constitutional rights cases, the first Eaton versus Brand, Brand County that recognized segregating children with disabilities into special classes against their parents' wishes could violate equality. And then later that year came the victory in Eldridge and you all know the iconic place that Eldridge has in 
our disability and constitutional jurisprudence. The appellants in Eldridge were born deaf and they used sign language. They argued British Columbia's failure to provide sign language interpretation in hospitals risked their health. In fact, one of the appellants was pregnant with twins and she went into labor prematurely and was left to deliver her babies, relying on hand gestures and scribbled notes. And this is the case where the Supreme Court found the British Columbia's failure to fund sign language interpretation for deaf patients was unconstitutional and violated the equality rights in section 15 of the charter. And this is, some might say, the heyday era of early uh, disability rights jurisprudence that changed the landscape of how the judicial, judiciary understands disability. It started that shift from a, viewing disability as a medical re, rehabilitation model that fixates on how to fix the, per, the disabling defect to what we now advocate for a purposive human rights prism that recognizes that disability is often the consequence of socially constructed barriers. In fact, the disability rights movement has laid much of the groundwork for our current understanding of the principles of accommodation, universality, and accessibility that are now applied across many protected grounds, including family status, religion, and gender identity. In 2003, I was Director of Litigation and Arch, as, as Rob mentioned, and I was honored to appear before the Supreme Court in the case of Martin and Lasseur on behalf of a group of injured workers who were interveners in the case. In Martin and Lasseur, the claimants challenged Nova Scotia work, the Workers' Compensation Act because the act did not provide compensable benefits for chronic pain. Effectively, it excluded chronic pain as a disability. And I vividly recall what it felt like. It felt like this aha moment over the judge's heads when I was making my submissions and then the light bulb went off and they understood the hybrid nature of chronic pain as coexisting both in the physical and in the mental realm, as a physical and a mental condition. And Martin and Lusser established that one, the one size fits all approach to disability fails to acknowledge that disability itself is inherently a diverse set of experiences. It can relate to pain, flexibility, mobility, vision, hearing, neurodivergency, inte intellectual capacity, mental health, and so on. And ultimately, it's the individual assessment that's needed and is intrinsic to understanding disability. And the last case I'll mention is from 10 years ago in 2012, the decision in Moore, Moore versus British Columbia, which circles back to our heyday of edu the education case uh, of Eaton. And Arch, again, was successfully intervened at the Supreme Court. And I think some of the council are still here, right, Rob? Moore challenged the school district's decision to close a diagnostic center that provided a range of support services to Jeffrey Moore, a child with a severe learning disability. The Supreme Court held the service cuts disproportionately disadvantaged Jeffrey from meaningful access to his education. The court held that accessible education is not just an extra or a special service, but it's rather the requisite measure necessary for students with disabilities to benefit equally from their public, for, uh, their public education and the education system. The Supreme Court emphasized that defining the services provided to Jeffrey as special education is it's a fic fictitious separate but equal argument. The court pointed out that concerns about costs alone cannot trump equality because accommodation is not a question of mere efficiency because it'll always seem cheaper to maintain the status quo and not eliminate the discriminatory barrier. I hope I've given you a sampling of some of the important cases that have strengthened and honored human rights protections for persons with disabilities. And I say these are just, I'm just scratching the surface of Arch's litigation history and the many important human rights disability cases that have come forward. I think you'll agree with me that while we observed real progress in the early years of disability jurisprudence, 
this progress has stagnated. And I fear we risk reverting back to the idea of disability as defined by stigma. As we saw in the recent heartbreaking decision from the Supreme Court in Ward, which involved a Quebec comedian who is allowed to mock and ridicule a child with disabilities. However, that's a whole other unhappy speech. And I'm I'd be happy to share with you my thoughts on that because I think it's regretful and shameful that that Supreme Court decision stands for the principles that it does, namely that freedom of speech overrides disability dignity. Some of you may know that the term handicap originates from the actual phrase of hand and cap, representing people with disabilities as beggars and objects of pity. And regrettably, I fear that antiquated phrase is still representative of the picture of people with disabilities in Canada. With roughly six two point million people living with disabilities in Canada, inaccessible education, inaccessible housing, inaccessible transportation, inaccessible communication technologies, lack of employment opportunities, and inadequate health and social services all remain an unfortunate and acute fact of daily life for people with disabilities. There is a clear quality of life hierarchy between those living with disabilities and those without. And that correlates with why Stats Canada reports that only 50% of people with disabilities are employed as opposed to 80% of people without disabilities. And then within this, people with disabilities earn significantly less than the able-bodied. If mildly disabled, you'll earn 12% less. If seriously disabled, you'll earn 51% less. Accordingly, people living with disabilities are the poorest among the poor in Canada. Even as recipients of government income assistance, a 2019 report from Maytree documents that people with disabilities are expected to survive on an average of 13,000 per year, which is 10,000 below Canada's official poverty measure. People with disabilities are not just disproportionately incapacitated by poverty, but they often shoulder extra expenses related to their health conditions and extraordinary costs to try to overcome barriers that societies erected that block their participation in mainstream world. So you're doubly and triply penalized. Let me wrap up now with sharing some of my final observations based on my experience in human rights advocacy for the last 30 years. Despite our beliefs of inalienable rights and the lofty proclamations of the codes preamble and the charter's constitutional guarantees, when it comes to disability equality, human rights are not something that are automatically offered to you or that you find in place as a matter of status quo. As the snapshot of history we've discussed has shown us, human rights require real, constant, persistent pursuit, maybe even relentless the way Rob's described it. It involves pulling legal levers. I believe human rights are recognized only when we press regularly and rigorously, and we have to commit to the toil and the labor of human rights litigation to advance the values of dignity, accommodation, and inclusion. There have been positive intervals when the law and our legal successes came our way, and then there have been periods of failures and retreat. Something that's been constant is that it's not given to us. We've had to fight for it. And in that fight, it's been that divide and conquer methodology. Despite what our code and constitution say about equality and inherent rights, human rights are not just going to magically appear. They're achieved by making our demands known and making our cases for equity. This is not a passive task, but one that is fiercely active as we have to keep it at it to compel the world to see and appreciate the value of human rights for peoples with, with, peoples 
with disabilities and our inherent dignity. So thank you, and I'm going to leave it there and turn it back to Rob. Thank you so much, Ina. Wow, you have given us so much to uh, to think about. Um, where to, where to begin? Um, thank you. Well, thank you for taking us on that time traveling journey and sharing your critical reflections um, on the evolution of human rights in Ontario. Um, you know, you make a really important, well, you make many, many important observations here, but to begin, the introduction of disability in the code is something we're celebrating tonight, but you remind us of the long fought journey that continued and that continues. Um, as you say, this is not a passive task. I think we, we can all speak to how during the pandemic, for example, human rights are constantly being attacked and we constantly need to be um, fighting for every inch. Um, so thank you for, for um, reinforcing and reminding us of, of, of our role and, and our um, duties as we continue to, uh, to enforce human rights. Uh, you provided us with such a great overview of, of some key cases. I realized it was quite a, almost an impossible task to try, try to bring, bring together, you know, this, this history in, in, in 15 minutes, but, um, but, but thank you for taking us through some, some key cases and, uh, and thank you for taking us through the Clark case. Um, as, as maybe most of you know, we, we lost Justin several years ago, but, uh, but his legacy lives on and, and thank you for, for, for raising that, that important case. Um, and, and you highlighted your, your ongoing concerns and uh, one of them being also the lack of comparable um, growth of damage awards and disability cases and the need for creative approaches to challenge this at the tribunal and, and not to yield, as you say, to over-reliance on, on medical evidence. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that um, you know, as well as, as you raise the, 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 the ward decision, um, and of course the statistical background that you provided with us um, leads me to, to to question you know given given this backdrop and given as you as you describe the, the lulls the ebbs and flows the the winds the challenges the pushback um, so in that backdrop that you've eloquently set for us what would you say gives you uh, some hope in terms of our efforts moving forward. So there is one thing I'd say this year that I believe was a real positive step forward for human rights and I uh, hope for disability rights. And, and that relates to the appointment of the Honourable Michelle Obonsuin as the new Supreme Court judge. I understand that she has had a distinguished career and uh, a lot of it was steeped in human rights as well as uh, disability issues. And if you look at her CV, she puts in, uh, she's put in there that she has practiced mental health law. And looking behind that, what she has, um, understand she's done is that she's appeared at the Consent to Capacity Board, that she has um, worked with the Gladue principles and dealing with uh, mental health courts. And I, in my mind, what that did was it juxtaposed to a, a story that I have somewhere back in the back of my brain from about 15 years ago when another Supreme Court judge, who I won't name right now, was being vetted in the appointment process. And during the appointment process had, was, uh, had questions put to the judge about the judge's work ethic. And I recall feeling enraged. I was just livid inside watching this proceeding when the judge answered that they had a very strong work ethic and demonstrative of their strong work ethic, they said they would only hire law students and law clerks if the student's CV resume showed that the student had labored away at a hard physical job. And that was the criteria this judge used for measuring a work ethic of a job of a candidate. And I remember being so angered by that. And this year, looking at the appointment of um, the Honorable Michelle Obonswin and thinking, here's a woman, an Indigenous woman, 
appointed to the court who proudly puts out there and, and talks about the work she has done on mental health. Um, and I hope it was for the right side. I can't say, I didn't do my research there, but I suspect as somebody who speaks to Gladue principles and appears before the Consent and Capacity Board that maybe she, you know, she's one of, on one of our teams. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ina. And um, I'm just noticing the time. I think we, we are going to have to um, wrap. And, and so again, I sincerely thank you. And I, I, I'm sure everyone um, joining us this evening is um, very grateful and you've given everyone uh, a lot to, to, to think about. And um, again, thank you so much for for making the time. I know you have, uh, as always, a lot on the go. So we really appreciate you being with us uh, this evening. No, so I, it, the honor was really all mine. It was such a pleasure to see everybody's smiling faces. I'm so glad to be back. And thank you for including me in this reunion. <laughs> well, and hopefully next year we can all be in a room together. At least that's the, at least we'll, uh, We'll aim for that. Um, yeah, wonderful to, to, to reconnect. Thank you, Ina. Sending positive vibes for a successful AGM conclusion then, folks. Keep Thank in touch. You. Thanks so much, Ina. And with that, I will turn it over to our chair, Douglas. Thanks, Rob. Um, my pleasure to uh, present my annual report. I just want to, before I segue into that, I also want to just thank Ed. You know, that was an amazing presentation. And it did the, to both contextualize our achievements and also hear about just why we need to continue doing what we do and why we need to be vigilant in our substantive work, which Rob will probably talk about in his um, report, but also why we need to continue to have strong governance for the organization. And the hard work that that entails with, uh, and that my colleagues and I are engaged in on the board. So Arch has fell into what seems to be like a new, the new normal as the pandemic and doors and morphs board and its committees continue to meet virtually. With advocacy over legal aid modernization now behind us, the board continues to focus in on the more typical aspects of the organization's governance. Goal of our strategic plan 2018 to 2023 was to foster board development, leadership, and succession planning. We continue to strive in that direction. We have created some practices, started last year of appointing committee vice chairs who have had to give them the opportunity to lead meetings and make reports to the board. And at the executive level, we continue to pra our practice of allow, having guest chairs, that is colleagues of mine on the executive, to have opportunities to lead board meetings. Uh, the executive has started to discuss the early stage planning for our next round of strategic planning. Over four years ago, we struck a working group on Indigenous issues. Earlier this year, the board adopted a proposal to make the working group a standing committee. And recently the board approved the na its name as the Moving Together Toward Supporting Reconciliation Committee. The, the committee is tasked with exploring how ARCH can continue to one, educate itself and the board and board members on indigenous issues, culture and disabilities, and two, improve ARCH's services to Indigenous persons with disabilities. And lastly, understand the calls to action and engage with Indigenous communities in advancing the calls to action. The Bylaw and Policy Committee has also been hard at work. 
not only with the regular cycle of review and updating our existing policies, but with consolidating various policies that were developed over time and are synergistic. In addition, the committee is assessing policies that assure they comply with changes in obligations stemming both from Legal Aid Ontario changes and the new Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporation Act. Our finance and personnel committees continue to do exceptional work monitoring these key areas of government. Due to their hard work, there is thankfully nothing exceptional to report. As I had said in previous years, I am privileged to serve with 14 other exceptionally talented and dedicated volunteers who tirelessly represent the interests of the disability community on the board. In addition, they provide the organization with countless amounts of energy, expertise, and dedicate, dedication to social justice. In short, passion. The governance of this organization could not happen without the time and efforts they dedicate. And I thank and salute them. Recognizing that it is healthy for the organization that leadership turnover at, a regular, at regular intervals, we instituted a three-term limit a number of years back. This year, we are starting to experience a cycle of renewal. We are always excited by the energy and ideas the new board, new board members bring, and I thank our nominating committee for the hard work to bring us the new slate board candidates that we are about to elect. At the same time, we are sad to three, see three of our colleagues retire. Rick Welland has recently left the board due to chain, a change of residency, where he has moved outside the province, which affected his eligibility to serve on the board. Rick served on the Indigenous Issues Working Group, and we thank him for his work there. Wade Pazimaka, and Roxanne McKintick have been exceptional contributors to, board, to the board in numerous roles. Roxanne has served on the Bylaw and Policy Committee, the Indigenous Issues Working Group, and has served as our executive, on the executive, as secretary for as long as I can remember, with the exception of this last year. Wade has in the past chaired our personnel committee and participated this year on the nominating committee. He has served ably as first vice president for many years. As impressive as these biographies are, they cannot convey the whole story of their calm leadership, sage advice, passion for the cause, and camaraderie. We will miss them immensely. I thank you for everything the three of you have done for Arch. And it's impossible to encapsulate our gratitude. I also note the passing this year of John Ray. And this maybe is a great segue back to what Aina was talking about. John brought a lot of passion to our board in, when he served. John was a passionate advocate for disability rights and has had an indelible impact on the disability movement. He will be missed in many quarters of disability advocacy. In the same vein of a belief about, vit about how vital it is that leadership turnover, I can advise that I will not stand for chair in the upcoming term. We have a deep and talented bench of leaders who can capably serve in this role. And I look forward to supporting my successor. I am deeply gratified by the confidence and trust bestowed upon me by my peers and for the honor they bestowed upon me. Nothing, but nothing is accomplished alone. And I thank the executive members I've served with for their wise counsel and the board for their input on issues, both big and small. And I thank our executive director, Rob Latanzio, 
for the incredible working relationship, partnership that we, he and I have had. The board thanks the staff for their tireless work to support us and for all the important substantive work they do. We thank them for adapting to the new normal and for their adaptive and for their constant adaptability. Well, wow. looks like we didn't pay the power bill or something. Um, excuse me for one thing. I think the lights must be on the time. Oh, there we go. Let there be light. And I, but I don't progress to have that power. So I was just uh, thanking the board for all they do. Maybe the most endemic element of the new normal is change. And our staff continues to be resilient, flexible, and professional. We, we acknowledge their impressive successes on numerous files this year. I reiterate what I've said in my prior annual reports. It is to the credit of our management team that we have, even in these very complicated times, a highly productive and supportive work culture. Particularly, I thank Robert for his leadership and the so many different aspects of Arch's legal work, stakeholder relations, and org organizational management that he contributes to. I acknowledge the retirement of a, our long serving staff member, Diane Wintermute, Wintermute, and thank her for her impressive contribution and wish her the best in her retirement. As always, we appreciate and acknowledge Legal Aid Ontario, Ontario, our principal funder, who makes it financially possible for Arch to continue to advance the rights of persons with disabilities. And lastly, as uh, Ina mentioned, it's my great pleasure to congratulate Rob on winning the 2022 Law Foundation Guthrie Award, which recognizes exceptional access to justice champions. Rob has been recognized for dedicating his legal career to advancing the full equality and inclusion of persons with disabilities that and Rob is in the company of previous winners, such as uh, former Attorney General Roy McMurtry and former Court of Appeals Judge um, Stephen Goud. We are so extremely proud of Rob's accomplishments and the accomplishment of art in this regard. So, thank you for your attention. And it's now my pleasure to send it back to Rob to um, for him to provide his executive director's report. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much, Douglas, and, and, and thank you for those kind words. Um, hello again, everyone. It is absolutely wonderful to be with you all. Just uh, noticing uh, all your names here. Again, wish we were together in a room. There's so many old friends and colleagues and, um, uh, it's so wonderful to to reconnect, even even just virtually in this way. But um, wonderful that uh, you're here with us this evening. Thank you for for making the time. Uh, I'm delighted to report to you select highlights of Arch's work and achievements uh, for the period of September 1st, 2021, to August 31st, 2022. And um, those those highlights in our report, uh, our annual report for for this year for that time period. Um, should be in your materials and you can also access um, it on our website as well. Um, so again, just a huge thank you to Douglas um, and, um, and also our brilliant keynote speaker, Ina Chatta, for sharing her, her reflections and insight with us um, and, and making time to be with us. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. So, uh, so thank you again. Um, and, and thank you again to Brett and Sarah for a wonderful uh, way to open our AGM and, and for, um, for all of your work in supporting and respecting rights. So thank you. 
While uh, still working remotely uh, to ensure the safety of all, ARCH has uh, provided and continues to provide leadership and support to disability communities across Ontario and on the national and international stages as well. Uh, during that time period that I mentioned, uh, over that year, we've had over 2,000 calls from persons with disabilities across Ontario on a whole range of different legal issues. We provided rights education to over 5,300 people across Ontario and Canada. Our publications reached over 7,400 individuals. And we have brought forward a number of important test cases before courts and tribunals and continue to work on, on substantial initiatives alongside our communities. I encourage you to view our annual report, um, which as I mentioned, should be within, in your materials uh, for this evening and, and also uh, on our website. And it'll offer more, more highlights of, uh, of that work. With several years now into the pandemic, I um, wish to thank our dedicated and passionate staff team and uh, also our wonderful disability law intensive students for their tireless commitment toward our mission during these really demanding and difficult times. So I know that uh, staff do not like when I do this, but if you can turn on your camera, I kindly invite you to please um, turn on your cameras if you can for a second as uh, we just wanna thank you for everything that you do. There you are. Oh, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we have some students joining us as well. Uh, it's wonderful. We have an incredible staff team uh, here at Arch. So thank you, everyone. Uh, this year, we, we did say goodbye to some of our staff. So we say goodbye to three staff members, Rachel Weiner, uh, Yingxi Tamang, and Diane Wintermute. And I wish to sincerely thank them for all their work and dedication to our communities. And we have also welcomed new staff. Uh, we welcomed Rachel Abitan, our communication coordinator, Alinka Stefan and Hannah Lee, staff lawyers, and Janelle Jackson, our litigation clerk. And in a short time, they've really become integral and vital parts of our team. So we're thrilled uh, to have them. At our eight annual uh, general meeting last year, also held virtually, um, I had described how our communities and other marginalized communities continue to feel acutely the failures of past and current social and legal policies, um, or policy and legal responses rather. We also had an excellent presentation highlighting the award-winning Into the Light exhibit and the Countering Eugenics Project, and a discussion of the legacies of eugenics and how it continues to shape the world around us in insidious ways and continues to be exacerbated by this ongoing pandemic. We continue to work through these systemic challenges in our daily work, and we continue to respond through a broad range of breadth uh, of activities. Our board of directors are critical to ensuring that ARCH continues to be a healthy organization. I cannot stress to you how grateful we are for this incredible group of leaders who consistently give us so much of their time, share their wisdom and share with us their expertise. They volunteer countless hours to ensure good governance and offer continued support, offering their time, they offer skills, insight. And they do that in matters that can be quite challenging. In particular, I wish to thank our chairperson, Douglas Waxman, for his ongoing dedicated leadership, as this may be his last year in his role as chairperson, as he had mentioned earlier, I would like to underscore how critical his leadership has been throughout the years and how committed and dedicated he has been to this organization. So I just really wanna take that moment to thank you so much, Douglas. I sincerely thank you for everything that you do for Arch. We are also sad to be losing important members of our board, uh, Professor Roxanne McKidiak, Wade Paziamka, and Rick Welland. I wish to uh, thank them for their exemplary service to ARCH, their sage insight and leadership and unrelenting dedication. We are so fortunate that uh, Wade will, will shortly be sharing some of his reflections with us um, from being uh, reflections on, on being a board member of ARCH. This past year, uh, as with the past several years, we and our communities continue to experience loss 
Uh, sadly, we have lost our respecting rights member, Antoinette Charlebois. Antoinette was a valued member of our team and most recently contributed to the Countering Eugenics Project. And, and Antoinette co-presented at our last annual general meeting on, on that project. We, um, as, as Douglas mentioned, we also lost another good friend and pillar in the disability rights movement, uh, John Ray. John, as uh, again, as Doug had mentioned, was a former longstanding board member of ARCH. Um, and uh, uh, he was a vocal and fierce advocate um, in, in the many advocacy activities that he would take on. So we will greatly miss Antoinette and, and John. Over, um, over the past year, ARCH has been uh, recognized for our accomplishments during this difficult period. Uh, following our receipt of the Pat Worth Award, an honor awarded to us by People First of Canada in late 2020, ARCH was awarded the Muscular Dystrophy Canada's Leadership in Advocacy Award in 2021 in recognition of our work alongside our communities during the pandemic. As uh, Douglas mentioned, and, and thank you for those kind words, Doug and, and Nina as well. Um, I have also just been honored with the prestigious Guthrie Award by the Law Foundation of Ontario. Um, these are very humbling recognitions and I wish to deeply thank the Law Foundation of Ontario, Muscular Dystrophy Canada and People First of Canada for these tremendous honors. Um, but it truly is a testament to the unrelenting dedication and commitment of our staff and our board team. So again, I, I thank our staff and board teams for everything that they do. Lastly, and with great gratitude, I wish to thank our funders and donors without whom we really wouldn't be able to do what we do. We sincerely thank our primary funder, Legal Aid Ontario, for its continued support of our work. Legal Aid Ontario's support is critical in ensuring that we can continue to serve our most vulnerable members of our communities. I wish to acknowledge and extend my gratitude to all of our other funders, and they're all listed in our annual report. Uh, our students, volunteers, donors, our membership and community partners, stakeholders, and supporters. Again, our annual report lists the names of everyone who has graciously given their time uh, to ARCH. And uh, I just want to end with a warm and heartfelt thank you to you all, uh, our members, our partners, stakeholders, uh, supporters, and friends. Um, thank you for your ongoing support. And uh, with that, uh, I turn it back over to you, Douglas. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, firstly, for those very kind words. I don't know if the camera picks it up, but I'm sure I'm blushing. Um, and Secondly, to say, Rob, you're too modest. You deserve the award you just received, and, and we really appreciate how proud we are of you. Um, it was in keeping in with our theme this evening of reflecting. Uh, we have asked two of our outgoing board members for. Um, to grace us with some of their thoughts about the organization, their experience. And we're going to start with Wade Pazamalka, who I just mentioned earlier and Rob mentioned. Um, it's been a very strong contributor to both the board and the executive played some important roles on the personnel committee in the past. And both Wade and Roxanne, and I'll be introducing a piece from Roxanne later, um, maybe two of our quieter board members, but when they spoke, it was worth listening to. And their contributions were always significant. So uh, without more, if, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Wade. Thanks so much, Wade. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I was worried I wasn't going to make it. I started a lengthy human rights hearing last week and it continued this week. And this is why you have my, my written comments on the PowerPoint presentation as well. But I am happy uh, and glad that I was able to make it. 
As I come upon my term limit to sit as a member of the Board of Directors, I want to take this opportunity to say a few words about my time with ARCH. ARCH is such an important organization in the province. Its dedication to disability rights is unparalleled, and its advocacy, litigation, and reform work is of the highest caliber. ARCH could never be what it is without its people. All of its excellent staff who give so much of themselves to advance a cause they hold dear. Litigation is not easy, it involves sacrifice. Litigating to advance or perhaps change the law is difficult. To walk in every single day and fight for equity seeking groups and individuals, often in uphill battles, takes its toll. We all need to recognize the commitment of the lawyers and the staff at Arch Disability Law Center. While a difficult and taxing job, it's certainly made a little easier by the leadership of Rob Latanzio and Doreen Way. Rob embodies all of the very best qualities and traits of a leader. He's empathetic, kind, passionate about his work, committed to the organization and his colleagues, thoughtful and reflective. None of the work that we do uh, could be possible without Doreen's steady hand, keeping us organized on task and moving in the right direction. It's been my privilege to get to know Rob and Doreen and work alongside them over the years. Want to recognize my colleagues on the board of directors. I can't envision a more dedicated group who volunteer their time to a cause that I know each cherishes and holds dear. Doug Waxman, our board chair, has led us with professionalism, dedication, and commitment, and his work should be recognized. Finally, I want to recognize Teresa Daw, our former board chair, who, as many of you know, passed away. The current state of good governance is very much owing to Teresa's work. She was a friend and mentor who I got to know well and connect with on a regular basis. I know we will all miss her leadership and friendship. I'm very proud of Arch and thankful and privileged to know all of the dedicated people who really are Arch. I will remember the years fondly and look forward to the positive impact that I know we'll all see from Arch in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wade. And I think everybody on the board would echo Wade's comments, particularly uh, about Teresa's significance and, and about Rob and Doreen's leadership. And um, I also want to acknowledge, sometimes we overlook Doreen a little bit in these meetings, but she is, she keeps us on the straight and narrow and certainly always makes me look better than I am. So thank you. Um, and again, Wayne, thank you for your contributions and, and, your, and your kind comments about me, myself. The, other um, outgoing board member is Roxanne McKidia, Professor McKidia. And not only was Roxanne our perennial secretary, uh, a contributor, uh, I recall, to the um, bylaw and policy um, committee and um, the um, Indigenous, Indigenous Working Group. But she also um, led our, from the Osgood side, our uh, disability, disability law intensive uh, internship um, and has done some incredible work developing that program along with ARCH uh, and bringing us some uh, great, passionate, young, talented lawyers some of whom we've uh, even gone on to be, become staff members here, or uh, sorry, uh, and board members. I think I've got that right. Um, so Roxanne couldn't be with us tonight, but she has provided a statement and I'm just uh, going to take a moment and read it. One of the first things I did when I became a law student back in 1986 was to sign up to receive what was then slow mail from Arch. Even then, I was interested in the work of Arch and was awestruck by the groundbreaking and impressive work that, is, that its amazing lawyers were doing. I had fantasies of becoming involved in doing that kind of work, in quotes. And when I was disgruntled by law school, I kept reminding myself that we, there were some folks like those at Arch who did the kind of legal work that made a legal education worth the slog. Never did I imagine that it would be fortunate, I would be fortunate enough to become a 
colleagues and friends over the years with those at ARCH or to have the privilege and opportunity to serve on the board. I truly love and admire this legal clinic. Its values, mission, commitment to disability rights, inclusiveness, and its people. I am so pleased that I am not saying goodbye, continuing my involvement with our students, the DLI, and the legacy of students we have mentored. I thank Roxanne for those kind words and observations. Uh, I hope it's not goodbye for either Roxanne or Wade or Rick, who. Um, and I thank them again for their contribution. So uh, that brings us up to a point in the program. We're gonna take a short break now. The next part of the evening is for persons who are ARCH members, according to our list of registered members. I ask that all March, Mar ARCH members stay for the business part of the meeting, which will begin shortly. Thank you so much to non-members for attending and we hope to see you in person in, next year. I ask that all non-members please sign off now. Arch members, please make sure that your Zoom name displays your full name. To rename yourself, hover over your own window, right click and type your full name. Amanda and Teresa ask that members on the phone unmute their phone, say their full name, and then change it so they can change it, it in Zoom. Thank you. So we're going to take a short break now. Um, we'll be back shortly to give you a sort of a five minute heads up of when we're going to restart uh, and then we'll head into the business part of the evening. Hi everybody. Um, we're going to start again in about three minutes. Just wanted to give everybody a heads up. So we'll see you then. We're looking forward to the business meeting. Thanks so much.
So welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to the business portion of tonight's uh, annual general meeting. Um, my notes say I'm supposed to in introduce myself here, but I think you probably know who I am by now. Uh, but just to keep Doreen on my good side, it's Douglas Waxman. I'm the chair. Um, and we have a few housekeeping um, as we did at the beginning of the meeting tonight. I'll just repeat some of the housekeeping um, points uh, for uh, just to bring back to memory for everybody. Uh, so please make sure your microphones and videos are turned off. This meeting is being presented both with both ASL and captioning. ASL is available in a separate video window. You can keep the window in view by pinning it. To do this at the top of your screen, hover over the window of the ASL interpreter you wish to pin and click pin video. Please be advised that the interpreters will be switching periodically. At that time, we will pause the presentation to allow participants to pin the new video window. Captioning will be available in Zoom as well, as in different in a different tab in your browser. To enable captioning in Zoom, select the CC icon. If you prefer captioning in a different tab in your browser, use the captioning link posted in the chat box. A link to the agenda and the AGM package is in the chat box. To make a motion, please unmute, unmute your call, say your full name, and speak. If you are using ASL, please turn on your video and raise your hand. Each vote will take place in three stages. First, those on Zoom will Zoom call will vote. Second, those holding proxies will vote. And lastly, those on the phone. When a vote is called, we will ask each of the following three questions separately. Are you in favor of the motion? Are you opposed to the motion? Or are you abstaining? Those on Zoom will use the raised hand icon to vote. This icon can be found by opening the participants list finding your own name and hovering over the three dots at the bottom of the chat screen. Raised hands will be cleared between each question. When called upon, those holding proxies use the raised hand icon. When called upon, those persons on the phone can unmute your call, say your name, and vote yes to one of the three questions. Votes will be tallied by our staff and announced by the chair. If you wish to make a statement or ask a question, please type your name in the chat. The moderator will keep a speaker's list and will call your name when it's your turn. If you are using sign language, please type your name into the chat to let us know that you wish to speak via ASL. The moderator will say your name when it's your turn to speak. At that time, you can turn on your video and sign your question. To access technical support, please email general, G-E-N-E-R-A-L, at arch, A-R-C-H, dot C-L-C-J, dot C-A, all in lowercase. So the first order of business this evening is to appoint a secretary of the meeting. Uh, if I could kindly ask for a motion to appoint Lila Rafia as secretary to the meeting. So if someone would kindly make that motion. I, I see a hand. From Janet Rodrigo. Hello. Uh, uh, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. The end of it is cut off on my screen. 
My um, name is Janet Rodriguez, and I would like to move a motion. Thank you. Thank you for moving. Your, you want to move the motion uh, for appointing the secretary, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Could we kindly have a seconder? I see uh, Ellen Cohen has her hand up. Hi, Ellen Cohen. I will second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, and hearing none, um, we all start the vote. So the, all those on Zoom, please virtually raise your hand to answer yes to one of the following questions. So are you in favor of adopting the motion? Please raise your hands if you are. Noted. Thank you. Any opposed? Sorry, any opposed? My hands have just gone down, so I just want to make sure I call it again. Noted. Thank you. Any abs abstentions? Noted. Thank Motion you. Motion passes. Thank you. Motion is passed. There are no proxies. Okay, thank you. And now um, those on the phone, please unmute your phone and answer yes to one of the following questions. Uh, Douglas, I don't believe there are any persons on the phone. Okay, that makes life a lot simpler. Let me know if that changes. I suspect it won't, but if it does. So um, I take it the motion is passed. <clears throat> All right. Um, the next bit of business is approval of the agenda for this evening's uh, meeting. Uh, the agenda, and will be cut and followed by that. Will following approval of the agenda will be approval of the minutes from the last AGM. They can be found in your AGM package, uh, and I believe there may be a link in the chat. Can I please have someone make the following motion uh, to approve the agenda? for Arches October 13th, 2022 annual general meeting. If someone, would, oh, I see a couple of hands. So um, I see a bunch of hands. Sorry. Mary Danielle uh, put her hand up first. Thank you. And Marcia Yale seconds. Great, thank you. Very efficient. Um, any discussion? Well, I guess there wouldn't be because based on, um, um, our bylaws, any changes to the agenda would have had to have been submitted at the end of September. So um, let, I'll call the vote. Again, those on Zoom, please use your raised hands. Are you in favor of approving the agenda? Noted. Thank you. Six hands come down. Thank you. Any opposed? Noted. Any abstentions? Noted. Motion Thank carries. You. Thank you. The next motion is to approve the minutes of the 2021 annual general meeting. So last year's general meeting. Um, only those present at last year's meeting are in a position to um, approve, to, to, to um, move the motion and to second it. So if you were there last year, and I see some hands already, um, Doreen, did you get yeah. the order? So Lily Luong Do uh, makes the motion. 
and Joyce Balaz seconds. Thank you. Um, I don't suspect there's anything to discuss. I, any, I suppose the, there could be, was there any omissions, errors? I guess that would be the only point we could entertain. Hearing none, uh, I am going to call the vote. Uh, on Zoom again, please use your raised hands. All those in favor of approving the, the minutes. Noted. Thank you. Uh, any opposed? Noted. Thank you. Abstentions? We have one abstention, Alan Cohen. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. So that brings us to our treasurer's report. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Michelle, our uh, treasurer who will uh, take over this portion of the business meeting. Jason, please take it away. Okay. Thank you, Douglas. Can everyone hear me? I can. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as meaning everyone can hear me. So thank you. I'm going to present the treasurer's report. <clears throat> I now make the following motion. Uh, not, hold on. Oh, not, let's not, uh, wait, I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. Hold on. I'm in the wrong, uh, bear with me. Bear with me, please. Here we go. Uh, bear with me. Here we go. The audit financial report of Arch Disability Law Center has been made available to all members of the 2022 Arch Annual General Meeting. The auditor, Hillborn, LLP, Chartered Accountants has prepared detailed report statements of ARCH as of March 31st, 2022. At page one of their report, the auditors expressed their opinions that these statements, in quotes, present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the organization is at March 31st, 2022, and the results of its operations and then in accordance with Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations, unquote. Any deficiencies in internal, there were no deficiencies in internal controls. The primary income source for ARCH is Legal Aid Ontario, providing approximately 90% of our revenue. In 2021-2022, ARCH received $1,614,944 in direct and indirect receipts from legal aid, salaries, insurance, supplies, services, etc. The total income from all sources was $1,810,646. Expenses incurred over the year, including salaries, rent, and office expenses, totaled $1,613,329. Overall, the statement of operations shows that we are in a good fiscal position with a funds balance of $658,569. The staff of ARCH and the board are focused on both controlling expenses and seeking supplementary funding to keep our income and expenses in balance while continuing to provide the highest level of service to everyone involved. That is my treasurer's report. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. So essentially, as Douglas kind of said earlier, there, there's nothing significant to a report. You might even say it's boring, but in this case, it's good news. 
um, nothing significant to report is actually good news and the ship is steady as she goes. So I'm going to now um, entertain a vote. So. So Jason, are you making the motion? I Can I or does someone else need to do it? I think someone else needs to do it. I, can someone, can someone, I, I'll entertain a motion to accept the fine, the treasurer's report. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Ellen Cohen, I believe, made the motion. No, um, it's I, I believe, sorry, I believe that it's the treasurer that's supposed to motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I will. I will. I, I will. Let's get down uh, make, to parliamentarian. Thank you, Jason. Go ahead. Thank you. I will. Uh, I will make the motion to accept the 2021-22 treasurer's report. Do you have a seconder? I will. It's Ellen Cohen. All right. The next question is. Those on Zoom, please do virtually raise your hands for all those that are in favor. Did we get all the votes? Yep, noted. Uh, opposed? Hang on, let me just lower the hands. Okay. Okay. No opposed. Abstentions, any abstentions? Please raise your virtual hand. Noted, motion carries. Okay, I have another motion to make and that's to uh, officially appoint uh, Hillborn Chartered Accountants uh, as our official auditor. I suppose I have to also make that motion, so I make that motion. Do we have a seconder? Marcia Yale seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your virtual hand. Noted. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your virtual hand. One second, sorry. Okay. Okay, sorry, again, all, anyone opposed? Any opposed? Noted. All right, any abstentions? Noted, motion carries. I thank you very much and I, I think that's all for me. I'll turn the meeting back to Douglas and I also want to congratulate uh, Rob on his excellent job, well done and very prestigious award. And again, thank all the outgoing board members. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jason, appreciate it. Let's keep things boring on the financial side. Um, our next, um, point of business is um, to adopt bylaw amendments. Um, in your AGM packages, you will have received a notice of motion with proposed changes to our bylaw. Um, they are of a housekeeping nature to a certain extent. Um, but you've had an opportunity to review those in your packages. So if I could kindly have someone move the amendments, please. Great. Carrie Great. Selkirk moves and Paul Scotland seconds. Great, thank you. Um, questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, we'll call the vote. Again, on Zoom, please um, raise your hands if you are in favor of the motion. 
Noted. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your virtual hand. Noted. Thank you. Any abstentions? Noted. Uh, motion carries uh, by a two thirds vote. Great, thank you. Um, and that now brings us to the nominating committee report. So uh, it's my pleasure to ask Laura Uppins, chair of our nominating committee, to make uh, the, the nominating committee's report. Laura? Thank you, Doug. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. As a reminder to everyone here, the nominations report and the bios of the nominees are in your AGM package. You can find the link also in the chat notes. I'd like to begin by thanking the other members of the nominating committee, Wade Paziemka and Rob Latanzio. We would also like to thank the midterm board members who are in office until 2023. Those board members are Doug Waxman, Emily Gillespie, Sandy Bell, and Yvonne Simpson. For the interpreter, can you read names slower, please? And sure. can you repeat those names? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Those board members are Doug Waxman, Emily Gillespie, Sandy Bell, and Yvonne Simpson. Next, let me take a moment to explain who is eligible to be a director of ARCH. That person must be a member of ARCH and not a current employee of ARCH or a person who's been employed by ARCH during the last three years. Also, a director cannot be a current client or a family member of a current employee a current client or a current board member. And a director cannot be a current employee of another community legal clinic nor employed by another community legal clinic during the last three years. And finally, a director must be legally competent to conduct business and enter contracts under the laws of Canada and its provinces. We now move on to the election. I would like to make the following motion to elect the following members to the Board of Directors of Arch Disability Law Center for a term of two years. Ashfaq Hussain. Claudette Paul. Dolly Menadak. Ellen Cohen, Harjot Dosange, Jason Michelle, Jennifer Heisler, Harry Selkirk, Michelle Wolfrey, and Paul Scotland. Could I ask someone to second that motion? Marcia Yale seconds the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? If you'd like to ask a question or to speak to the motion, you can type your name in the chat box. If there are no questions or comments, we'll vote now. For those on Zoom, please virtually raise your hand to answer yes to one of the following questions. Are you in favor? Noted. 
Are you opposed? I have one moment. Okay. Are you opposed? Noted. Do you abstain? Carrie Selkirk abstains. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Doreen. Welcome nominees back to the board of directors and thank you for your continued interest in ARCH. I'll now give the floor back to Doug. Thanks, Laura. Um, I also just want to echo Laura's uh, acknowledgement. Thank you for the returning board members. Um, of course, we've all love working together and um, excited for our, our new um, our new board members. Can't wait to start working with you and uh, look forward to seeing you at the upcoming October meeting. Uh, before we leave the whole nominating, sorry, my head's getting cold. Before we leave the whole nominating uh, aspect um, and uh, goings and comings of board members, uh, I just would like to. We would have, if we were in person, we would have done a, a, a presentation of plaques to thank our outgoing uh, board members. Rick, Wade, and Roxanne. This is what we, uh, this is our little token of acknowledgement and we will be sending these to you, but this is our virtual thanks yet again. And um, again, thank you for everything you've done. So that brings us essentially to the end of um, our meeting. Just before I ask for a motion for adjournment, uh, I want to just acknowledge the staff who makes this evening go and seamless. Can't, we could never do this without you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm glad Rob got you on screen because you're, um, it, it, you are what makes us go and um, you deserve acknowledgement. I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening and taking time out of your busy lives to support Arch. And if someone would be kind enough to move adjournment, we can close our AGM. Joyce Palaz moves. Thank you. I don't believe we need a seconder, is that right? That's right. Thank you. So we are adjourned until next year. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you all next year. Good night.